Yeah, no, and now maybe the the final question, which is probably the easiest one, uh, and while I've got you for a few minutes, uh, the man of lawlessness or the person of lawlessness. Yeah. Uh, what is it or he? What are your thoughts on? Because I was going to be like, oh, should I ask him about the rapture? I'm like, no one talks about the rapture anymore. In my background, you talked about the rapture. But now yeah, it's like, yeah. no, who's the man of lawlessness? Is this some sort of apocalyptic figure? Is it this? Is it that? What are what are kind of your thoughts on that? Because that's where I think a lot of people are like, yeah, that's all good. Racism, bad. Yeah. What does he really think about the man of lawlessness? So, hey, yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Well, the man of lawlessness, I mean, I there's there's some there's so much in that passage in particular. Um, in particular, in verses, uh, say, 6 to about eight the first part of verse eight there's stuff there that that hardly anyone knows what to do with okay <laughs> let's just let's just admit that is is i mean augustine said that years ago uh quite frankly i don't know what the apostle means here uh this business <laughs> about the the uh the, the, this it's even difficult it's hard to even translate one of the verses there hmm. uh but the man of lawlessness in uh in in general, what I do, what I think is, um, if if I'm if you're asking me what I think Paul in, in, intends to communicate, and I don't have access to Paul's mind, but I think that the language that Paul uses is best interpreted as Paul imagines that there is going to be a there's going to be a as he says, unless the rebellion comes first, or you could translate it. Um, I mean, yeah, you could rebellion could be a political or religious rebellion like some people would translate let's say apostasy comes first so it's religious oh, okay. apostasy mm -hmm. um but i but i take it as unless the rebellion and, and i think he's referring to a, a political rebellion which for paul would still be a religious one given mm -hmm. what he thinks about uh the the risen lord now but but i think he he's referring there um, and the reason I think that is Paul goes on to say uh, that this this man of lawlessness, he and, and, and unless rebellion happens first, then he doesn't go and and that he that he uses the language he 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 seats himself in the and I'm going to use English, but in Greek it there are two definite articles in the temple of the God. Hmm. Um, and so Paul uses two definite articles there in a way that, that in my view, a first century Jew using that language doesn't mean uh, just some temple somewhere in one of the Greco-Roman cities. He can only mean the Jerusalem temple. Mm -hmm. And even though I don't, whether the Jerusalem temple has any significance for Paul or not anymore, he, he can only mean that as a first century Jew. That, that yeah. seemed, I mean, not everyone agrees with that. There are some people who who still um, will argue that what he means is the, the is he's using temple there as a reference to the church because he does talk about the church being a temple of the Holy Spirit temple of God right um, I don't think he's doing so in this case at all hmm. um, and so that so so in other words until some that that's led to readings where oh you mean religious apostasy coming first and that must be the church and so the only person who could seat himself in the church must be a pope or something and that that in the history of the the, the reception of this passage some have interpreted it that way i don't think that would make a bit of sense to the people paul's trying to communicate to right i think he's communicating to this group in thessalonica and i do think he is uh he he is aware as a first century Jew that things are volatile. They were volatile all the way through the first century in Judea uh, with the Romans, uh, uh, Romans oppression of, of Jews. And they come to a head, as you know, in 70, in six, well, actually in 66 to 70, they come to a head. And so I think Paul is essentially imagining something that's taken place before or something like what's taken place before when uh, like when Roman generals come when Pompey came in 63 yep. and uh, you know I mean so so he dresses up the man of lawlessness where in other words lawlessness uh, uh, I'll, let me just let me continue with that thought he dresses up the man of lawlessness in Roman imperial garments yeah. that the only person who could do this in the first century was an emperor or a general who might become an emperor. 
you know, yeah. was a was a high ranking uh, person. So, um, so what I think Paul is talking about is he expects the the uh, political unrest in Judea to come to a head, mm-hmm. and for a Roman emperor or someone who is a, 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 a Roman general to seat himself in the temple of God. Now, no, no, uh, that had never happened before, even with Antioch Epiphanes and even with Pompey. Yeah. Um, they didn't seat themselves in the Holy of Holies. And such an act to anyone who knew anything about the significance of the temple and the Holy of Holies would be to say, um, I am un- I'm unseating this God as what you guys claim as creator. I am the king of the cosmos. Right. And, and so I think that Paul imagines that, uh, that, that that happens and that something that, 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 that person then um, it, it essentially uh, when that happens, then um, the Lord Jesus does return in the Lord's parousia. And I take parousia, not just his coming. If you've read my commentary, you know that I take this as a technical term. It, it means the king of the cosmos has shown up. Right. And there's parousia traditions about what you do. You go out and you meet him and you escort him back in and, and all that and proclaim him as true king and true lord. And so this man of lawlessness is said to have a parousia, where people do that sort of thing, whether after or before he comes to the Jerusalem temple. And so I think that Paul thinks that 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 that, that event will happen and that the parousia will happen. Now, what I say in the commentary um, is now the, the the fact of the matter is, as we know, um, uh, the Jerusalem temple isn't still standing. I don't think it's ever going to be rebuilt. Um, and so this, these exact events don't happen. Now, in 70, uh, Titus does come in and destroy the temple and, uh, or most of the temple in Jerusalem, and, and you know the story. Uh, and then, um, I mean, so, so something like this does happen. And, and so there is a sense in which Paul's prophetic vision, um, Paul's Paul's prophetic prophetic vision has an excess of um, promise over fulfillment. Let's say it that way. In the same way that uh, Isaiah sixty six, um, uh, which is a you know as you know kind of a prediction of what happens after the exile when they return right. from exile. Well, it, there's a there's a and and this like uh, this conceptuality comes from Richard Bauckham. Uh, where there is an excess of promise over fulfillment, but it doesn't get dismissed as false. What it does is it gets it gets it it gets taken as a pattern that can be projected on into the future, hmm. and so there's a sense in which what what Paul is doing here is um, is what I'm looking for when I read it is I'm looking for what I call Paul's anti Christology, hmm. and so what I Think the man of law. I don't think that this is Paul's view necessarily, but because I interpret this in light of Ro- places like Romans, mm-hmm. I interpret it in light of places like um, um, Isaiah fourteen, Ezekiel. Um, I'm coming up with it right now, <laughs> you can see where where uh, there are these arrogant kings mm-hmm. that uh, that essentially push. Uh, the, well, and in fact, in in in, uh, in it's in I, it's in Ezekiel, wherever it is, God is uh, God taunts this king as though he were Adam in the garden, hmm. and so the the king essentially uh, essentially pushes the sort of garden rebellion to its arrogant end, if you will, hmm. and I think that what Paul is doing is comparing and and they're comparisons and contrast between Jesus, both of whom Jesus and this man of lawlessness in Second mm-hmm. Thessalonians yeah. have a parousia. Um, and uh, th- their point, th- there's, there's reason to believe that Paul expects us to compare Jesus to this person. Hmm. And so Jesus, what I do is pick up on Paul's language of being in Adam and pick up on hmm. Paul's Ad- Adamic Christology to say that the man of lawlessness embodies the pattern of being in Adam, 
in Adam in extremis. This is the old Adam at its extreme point. Mm -hmm. And this is a pattern that the man of lawlessness embodies that is everything that Christ reverses. Mm -hmm. And so the passage functions to give the church a kind of, uh, not a way of predicting. I mean, maybe one day there will be a final sort of man of lawlessness, right? Right. In some sense. Um, but it gives us a, a, a picture of what it looks like to be the pinnacle of life in Adam, hmm. to, to be the very pinnacle of the old humanity, which Christ comes to reverse, hmm. to exploit this power you have and claim even uh, divinity with it unlike the one who, although or because he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, but rather used that vulnerable power in ways to benefit others. Hmm. That, so, so that the man of lawlessness exemplifies a, a pattern of what it looks like to be anti-human and thus anti-Christ which I think there have been over the years, many examples of that. Yeah. And, and, and in the history of the reception of this passage, some have sometimes taken it to be a single human being. I think that's what Paul means by it, but some have taken it to be a single human being. Others have taken it to be a collective figure. Hmm. You know, the, the left behind stuff and the, <laughs> all that stuff, yep. was, you know, people were interpreting scripture long before that whole way of viewing scripture came into existence. Yeah. And so, so uh, in the, in the middle ages, people understood this uh, figure to be sometimes a single human being, sometimes a collective figure of sometimes even the co a collective figure of what they call the wicked in the church for example. So they took it as a pattern like that. And sometimes they understood those reference that I refer as political rebellion, as religious apostasy, and the temple as the church. This has been received in lots of different ways this passage has in the history of the church. And I'm, I'm not saying that I know that I have it right, but I'm hoping, because I don't, uh, and it's been, but, but I think that I'm also exemplify, I'm also, I interpret it primarily as the upshot of it, offering us a pattern of what it means to uh, push the very, push things to the pinnacle of the old humanity. Uh, Paul will speak about, you know, the Romans 5 stuff right. uh, about Adam and the second Adam and uh, the, 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 the true humanity that Jesus uh, represents. Uh, he embodies humanity in a very different way than Roman emperors did. This would have been typical of a Roman emperor. Right, yeah. And so um, we, we're, I, I take the passage as giving us a picture of anti-humanity, and I say making a, a second hermeneutical move or a third that that uh, in fact white people have collectively embodied this very form of humanity or something very analogous to this form of humanity in what we've done in, I mean, where we've argued, use scripture to proclaim white supremacy. And in fact, even at times the inhumanity of people that we call black beasts, when actually the reverse has been true. Yeah. We've embodied humanity in beastly ways, in ways that are anti-human, in ways that are patterned after this man of lawlessness. Hmm. So those are, I know, just listening to this without the details, you may just go, <laughs> I don't know how in the world you can say those things, but uh, those are the big sweep of what I think about the, the, the man of lawlessness. And I'm working on right now that uh, trying to spell out those connections between how we collectively uh, in our history as as uh, white humanity seeking white supremacy have embodied humanity in a way that, that I'm calling the white man of lawlessness.
Hmm. That's not the only. Obviously, this pattern of anti-humanity, there have been lots of embodiments of it. And there are lots of individual embodiments of it. Yeah. You know, every every day, even at home, when when we when we ex, exploit our family members, even. I mean, yeah. it, it's not it's big and it's it's individual, but it's also it can be collective as well. 